Yeah. So, hi. Um, it has been a long day, I guess, but I hope uh, we are able to keep you all engaging for the next few minutes at least. Um, so yeah, we are going to talk about developing eBPF profilers for uh, polycloud uh, cloud native applications. Um. Yeah, well, my name is Javier, and um, I'm a software engineer at Polar Signals, and I've been working on on this thing we're going to talk about today. That is mostly focused on unwinding native stacks. Yeah, so uh, before we dive more into our talk, we wanted to talk a bit about uh, today's agenda. Um, so we want to talk a bit about uh, what we mean by profilers and especially what we mean by infrastructure-wide profilers. Uh, then we want to talk a bit more about like the lower level uh, ecosystem we, will, we are leveraging, for example, like the debugging formats, ELFs and dwarfs. Um, then we want to talk a bit more about uh, how stack and winding and walking is being done in the Linux kernel, especially, uh, and please keep in mind that uh, generally uh, industry uses like stack walking and stack unwinding uh, interchangeably, but uh, most of the time when profilers are using it, it's mostly just stack walking because we are not really uh, deleting any frames or we are not really changing it. Uh, we are just reading those data. Um, and then we want to talk a bit more yeah, we're going to be talking about um, how to build profilers using BPF and why this is a good idea. Uh, we're going to spend um, a good chunk of that also describing how to walk user stacks without frame pointers, because this is a big problem in, in the industry, I would say. And then we'll talk about some of the future work that we want to do, as well as some time for questions. Yeah, uh, so let's talk about uh, profilers for the cloud native uh, environment. So generally, as we all know, like developer machines and the production environments are not uh, similar. Uh, most of the time they differ, in, of, of course, like in the specs, but also sometimes in the OS, uh, arc level, et cetera. Um, and with the rise of like container technologies, especially uh, Kubernetes, we have kept adding layers and layers. Uh, so now it's like hard to manage the resource usage for servers and the host systems um, and small variations in the software that we run uh, between our development environment and production can have a big difference uh, wherever bottleneck slide. Um, so profilers help us to uh, pick into the resource use usage uh, like CPU, memory allocations, heap, IO, et cetera. Um, most com common type is the CPU profiler, which helps us to, uh, that's like the amount of time the CPU uh, spends executing particular piece of code. There are two main types of profilers, like tracing and sampling. Um, for the scope of this talk, uh, we will be talking about uh, sampling profilers. Um, raw data for the sampling profilers are generally uh, stack traces, as well as like the values attached uh, to those stack traces. So uh, we'll be talking about a bit more about like the generic uh, approach when it comes to the profiler model, but uh, we'll mostly be talking about what we are doing. So there might be different components, uh, which other people are using over there. Um, so first, uh, generally, uh, we have to decide what we want to profile. Uh, so most of the time, there is some sort of discovery mechanism we need. Uh, for the targets, we want to either profile certain uh, section of the processes uh, via PIDs or C groups, et cetera. Uh, in the traditional profilers, uh, people use signal handlers for that. Um, most times with infrawide profilers, it's nice if we can profile every uh, process. And that's also like sort of the model uh, we are using in our profiler, Parker agent. Um, once we have discovered what we want to profile, uh, Sorry, it's. Oh, oh now it's. <laughs> so, um, yeah, uh, so once we have discovered what we want to profile, um, we need a mechanism to collect the stack traces. Generally, uh, this mechanism involves at two levels. We want to collect the stack traces at kernel and then the application, like user space level. Um, and generally, these stack traces have IDs, memory addresses, uh, et cetera. Once we have collected this uh, stack traces, we have different formats to uh, use. Most commonly used one is pprof, which was created by Google. Um, it's both a format and a tool chain to visualize and analyze profiling data. Um, and it has like different metadata components like samples, locations, mappings, functions, etc. cetera. Um, 
And once we have that, we need to uh, symbolize it. Symbolization is generally the technique that allows you to translate like machine memory addresses to the human readable function names, et cetera, uh, line numbers, symbol information. Um, and again, that also happens at two level, uh, kernel and application, uh, different ways. There are different ways to symbolize it, uh, but mostly the process involves like reading symbols from say, dot debug info files, or uh, like in the case of kernel, we have proc k or sims. Um, there are also like remote servers like debug info d, where one can find debug symbols extracted from libraries and objects. And last but not least, we need to visualize this data in some other way. Uh, usually it's being done in the industry with, with the help of flame graphs uh, and icicle graphs. Uh, today, we will be mostly focusing on the part where we are uh, collecting the stack traces and uh, stack walking uh, in this cycle. So uh, before we dive uh, more into specific details about like how we are using eBPF for developing these profilers, we need to understand asserting foundational low level technologies uh, like the debugging formats. Um, also, please keep in mind that we are mostly talking about x86-64, so some of these details uh, can be different for the ARM uh, or other architectures as well. Um, so ELF and dwarfs. Um, so there are different debugging formats. They are like hidden and obscure component of our computing infrastructure used by performance analysis tools, debuggers. Um, it knows the state of the stack. Uh, generally, compiler knows the state of the stack every point in the function and it can output it in the different sections, for example, ES frame or debug info, et cetera. Um, another widely used format is dwarf, uh, which is a bit more complex than ELF. Um, it has like the basic uh, descriptive entry called common information entry, uh, which has like different sections and O code. Um, there are different tools uh, which are being used uh, to read this information at the moment, uh, like read ELF, opt dump, all of them have like different options. Uh, one of the uh, one which we use very commonly and we really like is the read elf uh, and a lot of different options uh, from them. So what does uh, this stack traces uh, look like? So for example, when C code calls another function, the call instruction pushes the written address onto the stack before branching into the callee functions code. In order to create a stack trace that's human readable, one needs to find um, each written address, look up uh, the function associated with each one and print each function name in the sequence. However, functions use stack space for other purposes. Uh, most commonly like to store the previous value for the callee, save register, or to store the value of the local variable. Um, each function's stack space can be accordingly different. Like, the size of the stack frame can be accordingly different. Uh, so it's difficult to know how many bytes are between each written address. Like uh, I have shown into uh, a small image in the x86-64 ABI specification, there are um, different registers called RBP, RSP, et cetera, um, which we'll talk about in the next slide. So, um, to get the stack trace, the first thing we need to know is the current program counter. Now, this is found in a CPU register called RIP, instruction pointer register, and it points to another region of the memory that holds the executable machine code of our program. But as mentioned, the variable length of the stack frame is hard to determine, and this is where the frame pointers come in. Um, so a frame pointer is a register which always contains the previous value of the stack pointer. And on x86-64, uh, the register in question is usually RBP. So frame pointers are generally used for stack walking. We start with RBP, then we continue dereferencing memory until we reach the bottom frame. In the process, we collect the written addresses for the functions. But there are certain pros and cons of uh, keeping frame pointers in your binary. Many distributions and packages actually disable them for the performance gain. If we use RBP for the stack unwinding, it's one less registers uh, that we can use for our code. And potentially more data will be spilled to the stack. This is not much of a problem when it's like 64 bits, but uh, especially for the 32 bits, there aren't many registers. So uh, 
it was used to be, or it's still a real performance problem in that sense. Um, we add three instructions to set up the preamble epilogue. So not only they have to be executed, but they increase the executable size as well, resulting in reduced instruction cache hits. Um, so what are the cons of disabling frame pointers and is it still worth doing? Um, so walking the stack becomes orders of magnitude more expensive, of course. Instead of involving a couple of machine addresses per frame, which is quite fast, we will have to do more work, especially in the unwinder. Um, debug information of some kind of is required, but sometimes this unwind information is not correct and it results into the inaccurate stacks because also because of the different format um, and how this information is being saved. Without frame pointers, the compilers or other, some part of the tool chain generates actually extra data. And this is more work that the compiler has to do. Uh, writing correct unwind information is very difficult as the different compiler passes, linkers, et cetera, need to keep them in the sync. And this is also sometimes case for the subtle bugs. Um, plus the, uh, the unwind information can be huge. And then the accuracy we have to determine and we have to test more, et cetera, sometimes almost as big as like executable itself. So what's the reality of the industry? At the moment, if you are a hyperscaler, it's fine because in Google or Meta, Meta um, most of the time, this code is compiled with frame pointers. Um, it's great as a debugger profiler impl implementer because it means that the walking the stack is very easy and computationally cheap, of course. Um, but the real reason why developers keep it is when you are under the pressure, you need the reliable and fast <laughs> stack traces, which is like must. Uh, but the harsh reality of the industry is that most of the engineering community elsewhere is not compiling all their software from scratch or, uh, or they are not really using the compilation options that doesn't keep the uh, frame pointers. Um, for example, GCC has the uh, option to omit the frame pointers, which is used by most of the binaries. Um, like OpenJDK has an option to preserve the frame pointers, which means that uh, by default, it doesn't have the frame pointer. Um, one of the reasons uh, we have come across why many, package, my, why many packages don't enable this feature is because their worries uh, are about like the performance penalty, et cetera, but also about the computation. And you have to uh, sort of really users need to know why this performance gain or loss is worth it or not. Um, one important point to also remember here is that even if you compile your application's code with from frame pointers, it's not enough because every single library that is dynamically linked with it also needs to be compiled with frame pointers and libc for most distribution isn't compiled with uh, frame pointers so um, is this worth it or not but there are also some frame pointer believers for example golang uh, after 1.7 version they have always been keeping the frame pointers uh, mac os software is always compiled with frame pointers we don't know when they started doing it um, the linux kernel is also compiled with frame pointers but there is an interesting exception, which we'll talk about in a bit. Um, but basically there's a config option to not use them. When this option is selected, unwind tables are generated and added to the kernel image. Um, then whenever the stack trace is uh, requested uh, for like say kernel profiling, live patching, et cetera, uh, the stack can be unwound using the method that's being chosen at the compile time. Um, and this is like props to a good work by Orc developers. Um, fun fact though, uh, kernel's just-in-time compiled code, eBPF, is also actually using frame pointers. This is all great uh, and fine, but of course, this doesn't cover everything. Um, what do we do if you want to profile any process running on the Linux box, no matter the runtime, no matter how it's compiled, how can we do this? So as Vaishali said, 
let's see some of the techniques that are used in the kernel to unwind the stack when there's no frame pointers, as well as some of the work that we're doing right now to make this work for user space as well. So first, let's take a look at the kernel. So the kernel, by default, uses frame pointers, but in x86.64, there's this option that you can enable at compile time. Uh, when it is enabled, um, it will generate uh, these unwind tables that are inserted in a custom L section. And this doesn't rely on Dwarf or debug frame or EH frame. So it is way simpler and faster and uses way less CPU. Um, the, the cool thing about this is that the uh, kernel mechanisms are completely abstracted away. So whenever you call any API to walk the stack, um, it just calls the right backend, which has been selected at compile, compile time. Cool. So some languages like, for example, C++ have exceptions, right? So how does this work? Like if there's no frame pointers, when there's an exception that is raised, we need to unwind it, but how does it work underneath? So turns out compilers like GCC and Clang generate information um, in the form of uh, dwarf debug information. So the stack can be unwound without them. So as Varshali was saying before, we need to figure out what is basically the value of the um, uh, stack pointer before um, the function started being called. So for the, for the previous frame. So these, these unwind tables um, could potentially be synthesized um, from the object code. And this is the approach that actually org uses. It partially disassembles uh, the code from the kernel and generates these tables. This is very interesting and it's something that we might do in the future, but um, so far we have chosen to go for the dwarf approach. There's some other creative approaches uh, that some people do, especially when you have to debug under pressure, you have no debug info, no frame pointer. So one approach that I find it interesting, but obviously we're not doing because it's a heuristic, is to um, dump the whole stack and find what are the values that look like they could be return addresses. So at the moment we rely on dwarf debug information. So let's, gonna, let's take a look at how this works. So here um, we're using Redelf to, to dump uh, this table for this test program. And here we can see the, the table for one function. Uh, this function has uh, four program counters, which are on the left. And then we have uh, three other columns. The first column tells us how to find the stack pointer for the previous frame. The second one tells us where to find RBP. And the last one tells us where to find um, the return address. This table is completely generic and has information about um, any register because any register could be pushed in the stack. But this is important uh, because uh, this mechanism is so flexible that in fact in Dwarf, it is implemented by, well, you need to implement a VM and decode a state machine to be able to actually generate that table. Um, so with this flag in Redelf, uh, we can have the opcodes and the effect that executing these opcodes have. Uh, so for example, you can see the opcode advanced location that basically sets a new program counter and the opcode um, of the family offset such as def, CFA, offset, and offsets, which for example, in the first case, show that in order to calculate the stack pointer for the previous frame, we need to get RBP and subtract 60, 60 bytes. So adding a small VM implementation in BPF is something that could be potentially very daunting and we want to avoid for many, many reasons. Um, but fortunately, we can take advantage of two insights um, that work for this particular case. Uh, the, the first insight is that we only need to restore three pointers, which are the stack pointer um, RBP, and, and we need to find the return address. And the other one is that our trade-offs are very different to, for example, what uh, the C++ and Y mechanism uh, trade-offs or what a debugger decides is more important to do. So usually the way they work is um, they are lazy, so they only find the unwind information for the program counters they need because there's not that many program counters they need to unwind. In our case, it's a bit different. Uh, we want to have a continuous profiler that runs all the time. So the cardinality of the program counters is going to be very high. In our case, we generate the tables ahead of time, cache them, and only update some metadata of them. So for example, uh, we can generate them for every single executable. And if there are dynamic library, we can update uh, the address where they have been, loading, been loaded. So it's kind of a little bit like a relocation, if you will. So uh, yeah, first let's take a look about how to walk native stack traces in BPF with frame pointers. Um, it takes one line. Uh, obviously there's a lot of work done by uh, the, the BPF developers to make this happen. 
And in reality, it's two lines. We need another one to define the user stacks map. And then this one to fetch the stack trace, uh, we get a stack ID, which is a hash of the addresses. And once we have this, we could, for example, send it to user space using a perf map, um, ring buffer, or we could aggregate it directly in user space. And this is actually what we do. Uh, we, um, we keep a count of how many times we have seen each unique stack trace. And um, every couple of seconds, uh, we gather these statistics, we generate some profiles, we reset these, and we get another set of profiles sometime later. But let's talk about how to do this without frame pointers. I'm sorry, didn't work. Cool. How to do this without frame pointers. So our current implementation is a bit more complex than the previous one. It is 250 lines of C code, obviously without comments or spaces. And the dwarf in unwind information parser and evaluator is more than a thousand lines of Go code. This doesn't account for tests, doesn't account for any other architecture but x86-64, and doesn't account for other sections. Right now, we only support EHframe. So as you can see, like just in terms of number of lines, it's slightly more complex than when you have frame pointers. First, let's take a look a little bit about the architecture. Like it looks like any other BPF application, really. We have two main components. We have the driver program. In this case, we use Go because we were already using Go that um, takes care of BPF uh, program and map lifecycle. So it creates the maps, the programs, loads them, attaches them, etc. And from time to time, it reads some input from them. And then on the BPF side, we have a map, which contains, um, well, we have several maps, but this is the most important one for us, which is a mapping of the process ID to an unwind table. And then the BPF program that is able, knows how to unwind the stack using these tables. Um, of course, an important component here is in user space, the unwind table generation. Um, so the unwind table is built up with a bunch of unwind rows, and these unwind rows have two main pieces of information. One of them is the program counter, and the other ones um, tell us how to restore RSP and RVP. Right now, we are omitting the return address because well, we have hard coded it. We know that at least in x86-64 is eight bytes ahead of the previous stack pointer, so we we haven't implemented that. But there's a lot of things here that in the future we might have to reevaluate. Um, one of the things that we definitely want to do is uh, we know there's some ways to make this a bit more compact and um, we'll talk about this later in the uh, future work. So um, the process we follow here is first we have to find the section uh, with uh, we use some elf parser and uh, once we find the section we want in this case we only focus on eh frame and later on we'll have to do debug frame which is similar but has some subtle differences, um, we have to, we're going to find once we parse information for every single compile unit and within every single compile unit, there is data for every single function. And then for every single function, we have a bunch of dwarf opcodes waiting to be evaluated. Once we evaluate them, uh, we have um, around, by the way, like 30 plus opcodes, I think. Um, we'll get a table that basically for every single program counter in the program tells us how to restore the registers. Cool, so in the BBF program, we basically have to do these operations. First, we need to find the unwind table for the current process ID, and then we do the stack unwinding. It's kind of a classic stack unwinding. Um, we, while main is not reached, we know main because we are passing it to the BBF program like the uh, uh, low PC and high PC. We append the program counter to, to the stack. Then we find the unwind row for the current program counter. And then we restore the, the registers. Uh, we need um, RIP, RSP, and RBP. RSP and RBP are needed because um, the unwind row has information on how to find the previous RSP, sometimes based on RSP or based on RBP. So once we finish this process, we should have um, stack trace. So yeah, um, we have to obviously do this efficiently and uh, the obvious way here is uh, by uh, using binary search, which is interesting to implement in BBF. Um, and the good thing about having this data already sorted is that we can of course uh, remove redundant rows. So um, sometimes for program counters that are adjacent, we have exactly the same information on how to restore the registers because they, are not they, they don't change. Um, so by doing this in some tests, we have saved around 10 to 15% of the entries in the table. 
So this is an excerpt of uh, the PPF um, unwinder. This is only the, the function that takes care of finding, um, of doing the binary search and finding the actual unwind row. Um, it's not very complex, it's you know, your standard binary search, uh, but I just showed it here to show some code uh, from our BPF unwinder. And um, also to talk about like two things we had to deal with, right? So when you're writing BPF programs, one of the most fun parts is to deal with the verifier. And there's like some easy things. Like in this case, we had to double check that all the accesses, um, all, all the pointer dereferences uh, were checked. So we were not dereferencing like a null pointer. And that all the array, um, sorry, all the um, array accesses were, you know, uh, not out of bounds. But then the more interesting ones was that um, the BPA verifier checks, uh, symbolically executes all the code paths that your program could have. And for our simple binary search, not this one that we're showing, but the previous iteration, um, it was complaining that um, it was getting one million of symbolic instructions that it had analyzed. The problem was that we tried to reduce um, the amount of iteration that this unroll loop was doing. And the verifier was happy doing seven iterations of less and two to the power of seven is not enough. So um, we need at least 15 or 16 iterations so the uh, current workaround that we have is that uh, we use PPF loop, which is very, very new, but it's amazing. But of course, uh, we want to support older kernels. There's some people that uh, use our open source product and they run very old kernels uh, that have BPF protocols, but not BPF loop. So yeah, there's uh, quite a bit of stuff to keep us busy. So we want to test um, all this implementation in bigger real life binaries. So far, uh, we have done this work on small self-contained binaries and this worked so far, but I wanna make sure that it works on any application. So for example, some, something that we need to work on, we already fixed a lot of bugs here, is on the table generation, right? It's easy to not implement some opcode properly or implement not implementing it at all, and then your table will be completely off. We only support x86-64, uh, but of course there's a lot of people in the cloud that are running ARM64, so we wanna run that in the feature as well, at that feature. And um, an important thing is that the table size is static. Uh, we have an upper, an upper limit of 130,000 entries, which is enough for big application, applications such as the C Python interpreter, but um, some other applications that people run um, will use way more entries. Um, and we need to do a lot more testing and we want to engage with different communities because we think that this is an industry-wide problem that is worth fixing. So uh, happy to take any questions and of course to talk with you in the uh, away track. Well, one comment actually, join the fight. We are proposing uh, for Fedora to build everything by default with frame pointers. <laughs> so. Hi, uh, it's a good presentation. Um, it's interesting about you, you put that uh, whole the, the friend information into the PPF uh, in the map, right? So how many is this? How is the, the size of your your information? Yeah, so I, I had way more detail to talk about, but I was being told that we were over time. So. Um, some of the approaches right now, we only have uh, 130,000 items, rows that we can put in this table. Um, and we know that we will need way more for some other binaries. So the idea we have is, of course, to split it in chunks, to shard that, if you will. Um, and one of the most obvious things that we want to do here is um, shard by build ID. Um, so have the different, like, for example, dynamic libraries uh, in their own kind of table. Still, probably for some big binaries, we'll have to split a single binary into uh, several tables. Um, so we'll probably have two levels of binary search, one to find which PPF map is the one to, to use. And then once we, we find that one within that table, right? Um, but this is something that we're gonna be working on for in the next couple months. Uh, and by the way, everything's gonna be open source. Um, so so yeah, like we, we hope to release this um, uh, hi, uh, where can I get uh, your implement? Uh, where can I get a source code of your implementation? Yeah, so our project is open source, but this implementation hasn't landed yet. Um, but our, our project is called Parka Agent. If you look it up on Google or GitHub, it should show up. 
Um, but right now it only supports uh, binaries compiled with frame pointers. This is something that will hopefully land in some weeks. There is a comment in the chat for everyone interested in profiling, there is hotel approach to unifying the industry, open telemetry profiling reason. I don't know, check the chat, there's a link. Um, you guys are using perf events under the hood to gather the stacks, right? Have you considered using uh, LBR to help you unwind? Uh, sorry, which thing? Uh, the Intel last, last branch record. Oh, yeah. But the problem is that um, in cloud environments, uh, it's not always, well, as far as I know, it's almost never virtualized. And uh, that's a problem. Some of the people run AMD and um, yeah. So uh, the problem we have here is that we want to have some solution that works for the, the bigger set of, of, of users. And, and there's many of them that don't, don't have them available. Yeah. Gotcha. Yeah, so as I said, I think like the only like really production, like general production approach is like to compile everything with frame pointer. That's why like we are proposing for Fedora to do it like by default. Mm -hmm. It's obviously a lot of people have preconceptions how, how big of a performance hit it is, which it's not. Like there is some noticeable slowdown in some applications, but like it's 0.2% mm -hmm. or something. So yeah. as I said, join the find. I mean, we, we are obviously like, yeah, uh, so that is from the application to application, right? Yeah. So, it, that's also yeah. not yeah. Actually, But you also have to do a proper benchmarking. Yes. You know? yeah. with, so there were some people. cases when like it was benchmarked with frame pointers in debug mode versus production <laughs> mode without frame pointers. So like there were like yeah. thousand percent difference or something. But yeah, of course, like we, we believe that frame pointers will be uh, like the best thing to, to have, right? Like uh, I used to work in an environment where everything was compiled with frame pointers and it was amazing. But even if Fedora decides to, to do this, which I hope they will, um, what about all the other distros? What about all the other code that is running that is not going to be updated? So we... One step at a time, exactly. I would say. Someone has to start. Yes, I agree. Yeah. All right. Thank you very much. We are out of time. Thanks for great presentation.